Today I'm going to talk about how to optimize um, time to data for streams and data abstractions. Uh, and there's a, like, a bunch of AI in the sauce to be able to do that. Um, so before actually talking about this, um, let me introduce myself a little bit. So uh, my name is Nick. I'm like the VP of engineering and CISO at Datalog. Uh, before doing that, I worked at several startups. I co-founded um, and was CTO of a startup called Gitlinks that was doing risk management software for open source software. Uh, also worked at the French DoD in security um, and uh, grab, visualization, grab visualization software called Linkurious. Um, I was front end lead there. Uh, but let, let's deep dive a little bit more into Datalog and uh, how we measure and optimize time to data. So why measure and optimize time to data? We believe that there's a universal truth, which is like every like enterprise is trying to become um, a data-driven enterprise, and that's like that kind of like been existing forever because um, company actually have been using Excel for quite some time, and like they've been doing like quarterly schedule on Excel and taking data in and making predictions, this kind of things. So it's like not something that's very new, but it's like, extending beyond just. Financials. It's like using CRM data, trying to like consolidate all that data into data lakes to try to uh, actually do something about it. So basically, what they're trying to do is like a manufacturing plant, uh, getting data in, doing something with it, like a process, um, like to change it, and then starting analyzing it um, with analytics tools, and then producing a decision out of it. So it's very much, uh, throughout the talk, I'm going to draw a parallel between manufacturing and like data engineering, which I think are uh, very, very similar. Uh, so in that lens, the, the time that it takes for you to take a decision can be decomposed into two things. First thing is um, the time that it takes for you to get the logistics of your data. So uh, figure out how to transfer it around, get it on the system to run your analytics, like all those things, which is just a pain, but you have to do. Uh, and then running your analytics on the top of that data. Uh, what we do at Dialog is optimize the time to data. So we make your logistics super easy for you to get the data where you actually need it. Uh, so basically what you're doing is be take that big pile of mess and like streamlining it uh, to put it somewhere useful. And during the, the talk, I'm also going to draw parallel with uh, one of our customer use case. So here, uh, what you can see is like quite interesting. It's a Wi-Fi access point data uh, that's happening live during uh, the hurricane, the last hurricane that we saw. So that's a tele telecommunication uh, customer. Um, and what they want is to be able to have that visualization. Uh, the reason why it's important is um, because they want to be able to send uh, the ma maintenance workers uh, to uh, the right locations to be able to restore uh, connectivity. And connectivity is super important because it's used by uh, first time responders to be able to uh, answer calls, uh, also for, from like, uh, people to be able to know from which route to get out of a hurricane zone. Uh, so super critical to have near real time data and good data uh, to be able to draw this visualization. So this is uh, right before the hurricane hits, like the, and this is right after. Uh, so you can see like, hey, everything is going down. So this is like really super important for them. Um, so in order to, to get to those things, I'm going to start by beating an old horse with like manufacturing, lean manufacturing principles, uh, and see how we can apply those things to, uh, to actually time to data, uh, and how to improve that, uh, that, that like process. So the first thing, I think you all have heard about uh, agile methodologies and how like working progress is the root of all evil. Uh, so you really need to find like those uh, steps that are too big before they drive value. Um, so the same way uh, with agile for data is like what you want is like do a little bit of a work, like ship it, a little bit of a work, ship it, do a little bit of a work, ship it, and not like, hey, I'm going to wait a week, do all my work, do a big process, and then maybe in a week I will have a thing, or not if I screwed something up, uh, and then I need to start again. Uh, so every working progress, same thing, root of all evil. 
So the way we do this is through two things. Um, flow optimization. So how do you uh, really uh, take your data and like streamlining it to where you need it? Um, and how do the user also like uh, um, has a good flow to interact with the data? So getting feedback loop very fast is really important so that uh, you don't end up with uh, a feedback loop that's really slow. So for example, Spark, uh, you have to compile your program, you have to deploy it, and you start getting feedback, and you're like, uh, start again. It takes forever, and it takes like so much time. So uh, flow optimization is super important, and just-in-time delivery is the second thing that's super important. So as soon as you're able to pro start processing data, you should start processing your data right away so that you have the first results and you can start having visualization. Even though it's not the most accurate, then like the accuracy is like building up as you get more data. Um, so in order to walk through those different type of things, um, I'm going to go back to the manufacturing uh, kind of analogy and talk about how the um, bill of materials is relevant to all this. So before this talk, I didn't know what the bill of materials was, so I'm going to explain to you what it is uh, so that we're all on the same page. Um, the, it's essentially an inventory of everything that you put in the car or like something that you built. Uh, it's not only what you put in the car, but it's also the transformations or like the processes that, that are in there. So um, if you have a wheel and like a tire, um, the process of putting the tire on the wheel will be within the bill of materials, right? So in terms of data, that's about the same thing. Um, so in our use case of telecommunication data where we want to have a live stream of uh, where are the access points that are live and which are the ones that are not live, what you want to be able to do is take uh, one source of data, which is going to be, um, hey, access point with MAC address uh, A is um, live, and then you have another source of data which holds the longitude and latitudes of your data, of your like, access point. So uh, what you need to do is be able to join those data on the fly while the events are coming in, um, and then being able to have that result data assets, that's actually something that you can use to build your visualization. So bill of material describes two things. Um, the components of your data, and then the transformations that you apply to it. Um, so we're going to dive into those two aspects on how we can optimize them uh, to reduce the time that it takes for you to actually get your data where you need it. Uh, so first is uh, sourcing all the types of material that you need. So um, as a manufacturer, I'm going to have, to build my car, I'm going to source things from um, uh, like a, like Ericsson, for example, for my electronics. Like. And then you will have another supplier for your tires and like wheels or for your body. Like every type of like source of material is going to be different. Um, and so like s manufacturers, they found, they find their like raw materials across a wide variety of suppliers. And for data-driven businesses, it's exactly the same way. So if you just drive value from uh, one file that's being like outputted from whatever system, like a CRM, it's probably like a little value, but a little. And then if you start like cross-referencing it with some other type of sources that's uh, peculiar to business, that starts being more interesting. And the more source of data you actually aggregate, the more interesting things become. Um, so data-driven businesses, they drive value from a wide variety of sources. Um, but the what if? we could abstract this away. So right now, like for a supplier having a wide range of supply, uh, of, for a manufacturer having a wide range of suppliers, it makes things difficult and complex. Uh, same thing for data sources. Like when you have a wide variety of sources, it makes things difficult and complex. So what we do um, is model that thing in, if you model that thing in um, a way where you have like n sources and n destination, roughly you're going to have n square combinations to like build pipelines between every source and every destination type that you want. Um, basically, this is it's just if you want to copy stuff. If you want to start transforming your data, then you're like expanding a little bit like that space, and that becomes even more complex. Um, so what we do at Dialog, and now I'm getting a little bit more in the meat of like the tech. Um, is that we put something in the middle, uh, the same way the LLVM is putting an intermediate representation to be able to compile to several uh, target systems. So like to 
explain that a little bit more. Uh, so languages that are com natively compiled, uh, there's a backend called the, the LLVM, and that backend uh, is like a standard representation. All languages compile to something standard, and then you have like machine code for each one of the architecture. Um, here, that's the same thing, but on data. So the idea is that you have encoders and decoders that are going to um, lift the representation from something very concrete, uh, so JSON, Cassandra, SQL, those kind of things, uh, to a graph, a series of graphs. And then you do your work on those graphs. So now you don't need to have uh, scripts for tabular data, scripts for like tree like data, scripts of, for JSON, script for CSV. You just have your script for ADGs, and then you can plug that onto any source or destination that you're interested in. Um, the, the way the ADG works is very, very simple. Like, there's nothing more simple than this. It's a directed graph with two properties a label and a value. Uh, that value can be optional and is typed. So, like the types uh, are things like strings, booleans, um, integers, floats, all those kind of things. And with this data structure, we're able to uh, abstract away pretty much like anything that, that comes in. So, this is like handling the first layer of abstraction that we talked about, the first layer of variance, which is hey, as a data engineer, I want to be able to. Uh, get data from Postgres, from like Mongo, from um, MS SQL, and I don't want to lose time rewriting the same scripts all over again. Um, what if we could also abstract another layer uh, within that stack, which is uh, the semantic types? So this is where the machine learning comes in, and this is where the intelligence is really. Um, once you have the data, the data can still be structured in different ways. So a good example is dates. Um, dates in France, uh, they're like we write uh, days and months the other way around uh, than here. So like as a developer, it's like when you're starting writing like uh, international systems, it's a pain in the ass because like those dudes are like doing things the other way. Um, and so like being able to do transformation and standardization of the data uh, the same way, whatever the actual like uh, string is is like super powerful. So instead of saying, okay, so I'm gonna get um, my my string and then I'm gonna analyze what it is and then I'm gonna do some transformation. What I'm gonna do is, okay, get me the dates in my data sets. I don't know if it's JSON. I don't know if it's SQL. I, actually, I don't care. Um, just get me the dates, standardize them, and then do a join on that other other data sources which also hold dates that are correlated. Um, and so as a human, you have the intelligence of being able to say those two things are correlated, but you don't have to care about how those things have been implemented in disparate systems. So it like, reduces your time to actually do something useful uh, drastically. So this enables you to handle variance a lot. So a tra traditional problem in manufacturing and in data science as well is that um, it's super hard to produce uh, the same thing repeatedly, right? So um, in a manufacturing plant, so I worked at some point in like a tile factory in Europe, and so like the defect rate is something that like huge, and like, uh, like half of your production just go to the bin because they don't respect like the, the variance standards. Um, this is a huge problem. The data engineering, same thing. You have errors, like once you get into big data, you have errors all the time, and then like, like for some reason you have one JSON payload that's different than everything else and everything breaks. Um, so huge pain in the ass. Uh, the way with those two layers of abstraction, you're removing that pain because the, machine, the combination of that abstraction and machine learning is actually uh, abstracting that away and you don't see it anymore. So you build your thing once and then it works all the time. How is that related to our customer use case? Um, Telecommunication companies, what they have is a network of IoT devices uh, which have um, like different versions, different brands, different configurations. So here, like access points and routers, you can bet that like all across this geographical area, uh, you probably don't have, you probably have 10 different brands with like 15 different configurations, 
and like the logs that are coming in that are giving you like the activity are actually not standardized at all. Uh, but you still want your own like one visualization which aggregates all that data. Um, so this is where what we do comes in is being able to take all that data, standardize it so that you can build your visualization on top of it. Um, so in terms of velocity, what does that mean? Um, so we have, we've talked about a little bit like the, the time that it takes to handle different data types. We've talked about the, the time that it takes to handle different data sources, um, but we haven't really talked about volume and this like little thing of I. So data volume is not something that at log we, we really handle. Uh, like we still can handle quite a lot of data because we, the, the telco usage that you've seen is like uh, hundreds of gigabytes a day to terabytes of data, data so it's like still uh, fairly good. The, but like abstraction has a cost, so obviously you're not as fast as if you write your pipeline in C or assembly, uh, if you can, in assembly. Uh, but the one over I is about the iteration process that it takes to, um, to redo the work or like to iterate on the work. So when you have, I was talking earlier at the beginning of like, uh, you want to ship things small and ship things fast uh, versus like a big thing and then try again. Uh, this is very related to like batch processing versus stream processing. So batch processing um, obviously has some like good points. Like it's like it's usually higher throughput than um, stream processing. Uh, but like the, the, the problem with batch processing though is that you having your file, you're transforming it for one first time, potentially you have an inventory in the middle, and you're transforming it like another time, then you have another inventory, then you're transforming another time, and then eventually you get your result, but you only get your result once you've done your process on all your data. Uh, the stream processing is more like, uh, hey, I get first element in, I work on it, get to the next guy, work on it, get to the next guy, then like, um, put it out and I can get my first time to byte very fast. So um, near real time results and like a much lower latency than the batch processing job. Um, obviously there's also hybrids in the middle. So like there's like a uh, stream with batching in the middle and you can, you can mix and match. But the idea is that the time that you get your first byte is much lower when you do streaming. And that's still important, go back to our cases of uh, telecommunication. Super important because hurricane, uh, people die. So uh, you need to have data very fast. If you have your data one week later because your batch streaming is taking, your job is taking a week to run, uh, then you, that's too late, like, it's like useless. Um, so it's better to have uh, data like quicker than have it like not when you need it. Um, so in terms of numbers, what does that mean? So uh, with that client, with that customer, we actually reduced by 99% uh, the time that it took for them to uh, actually start using data. Um, so it's quite a lot of time. Um, and we also not only decrease the time it takes for them to access the data, we also improve the resolution on which they are uh, seeing the data by 170x. Uh, so that's, those numbers are a little bit outrageous, um, but that means that we, they were able to send people to the right places at the right time, uh, which is super important. And uh, on the right, you have like a little bit of statistics on our machine learning algorithms, like uh, how accurate they are, and we like on the upper 90s, like uh, on the accuracy levels. Um, so I think this is it. I said for things like uh, quite fast. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, those are like my social media handles if you want to ask questions. Um, like uh, I'm up for question now. Yep. No, there's edges between nodes. So you have nodes uh, and then you have edges between nodes. So it's a graph like the, the the, the ensemble of nodes and edges is the graph. Sorry. Edges across source is the edge. They are edges. So if you have a unique identifier, yeah. 
Like we're working on the implementation. So as you, we go through, like we've went through like several iterations of like what that graph looks like, uh, like the implementation wise. Um, but yeah, we do have some like internal ID system to be able to like make the links between the nodes and edges, um, and like being able to efficiently go from parents to children. So like a lot of the transformation that uh, people want to do on the data is, for example, um, hey, there's like two. Uh, two nodes of data, I want to add them, or I want to do a join between two disparate data sources. So the join is something that people like to do a lot. Um, so the use case of one, once uh, in one database you have your location data, in another database you have uh, your like real time feed of things that are coming in, and you want to be able to join those things as they're going in is like something that's super interesting there. So it's like you just like you have two graphs and you merging them on the fly.